Welcome to Anti-Tank Chats. In this series, we will take you through the history of infantry anti-tank weapons. In this episode, we will be looking at the development of the projector infantry anti-tank, known by its acronym, the PIR. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. As we already covered in an earlier anti-tank chat, Britain entered World War II, like most nations, relying on the anti-tank rifle, in this case the boys, and also the anti-tank gun, in their case the two-pounder, for its infantry anti-tank defence. The fighting in France by their BF in 1940 demonstrated that the need for a more powerful infantry anti-tank weapon was urgently required. Like its contemporary, the bazooka, the Piat was not solely the development of one individual, and it would undergo over 70 design changes between August 1942 and April 1943. Whilst the exact origins of the Piat are difficult to pin down, its creation and development involved two individuals, Stuart Blacker and Millis Jeffries. By the summer of 1940, Blacker, who had already been working on spigot weapons, successfully demonstrated to the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, the capabilities of his 29mm Blacker Bombard. In an earlier demonstration at Purbright, the firing of six 20-pound anti-tank projectiles knocked the turret off a of Matilda II and made the three-inch armour look something like Swiss cheese. Blacker commented that the crew would have been macerated. In this guise, the Blacker Bombard was deemed a success and given the production nod, with a total of 32,195 Blacker Bombards being produced. GHQ Home Forces even remarked that the Bombard fully justified the, its adoption as an anti-tank weapon, both by the regular formations and the Home Guard, but it had one serious drawback, its weight. In this iteration, the weapon weighed 112 pounds, 50 kilograms, without the mount, and a further 232 pounds, 105 kilograms, with it. Not exactly man portable. To be fair to Blacker, he had also been working on a 21 and a half pound bombard, just under 10 kilograms, which he called the hand bombard. This weapon was designed to fire a Hesh high explosive squash head round that would provide the infantry with a support weapon that was capable of anti-tank, grenade launcher, and light mortar capabilities. It was rejected. Jeffries now enters the frame. Jeffries had been involved with the development of a number 68 projector to fire a larger diameter shape charge warhead based on the number 68 rifle launch grenade. What became known as the Jeffries gun, basically a 28 pound tube based weapon, which used a foot operated wire to cock the mechanism, was then demonstrated at Bisley in early February 1942. Black had also been invited and he showed off his baby bombard. A meeting was held shortly after, and the merits of the two weapons and their respective projectiles were weighed up. To cut a long story short, new research indicates that it was an ICI who were tasked with designing a new weapon which incorporated the best features of the two weapons. The general staff requirement was for three initial prototypes to be produced. The weapon had to be under 28 pounds and used a Bren Mark II bipod. Improvements such as lengthening the weapon's body so the projectile's fuse was protected and using a movable butt plate for cocking were discussed as well as sights. The use of drum fins were also discussed to provide stabilisation, a feature which Blacker reiterated would keep the round stable in difficult wing conditions. Blacker also recommended the use of a retaining clip. He patented his own design so that the projectile would not slide out of the weapon when pointed downwards at an angle. Tests of the new bomb in late June 1942 were successful. It was capable of penetrating 100 millimetres of armour at 30 degrees and officially became the Mark I Piat bomb. This success led to an order of 100,000 Piats, 10 million live rounds, as well as numerous practice rounds. ICI started to gear up to manufacture 10,000 Piats with 50 rounds of ammunition each from January 1943. A further demonstration in November 1942 confirmed the Piat's capabilities, with three Piat's registering five hits in 20 seconds on a moving Churchill. In terms of combat use, the Piat made its debut 
with infantry units fighting around Majez el Bab, Tunisia, in March 1943. In an action at Point 174, the following month, a Sergeant Oscroft of 2nd Battalion, the Sherwood Foresters, would see his peer at round, glancing for Tiger 1. 70 years later, his son Dale would be instrumental in correctly identifying Point 174 as the location where the museum's Tiger 131 was disabled and captured. Moreover, even though the round glanced off, this would mean that the Tiger 131 was likely to have been one of the first German panzers, not just one of the first Tigers, to be engaged in action by a Piet. By September 1943 and their Allied invasion of the Italian mainland, it started to become clear that the Piet was not only deadly against armour, but it also offered the infantry units, those who had been issued with it, the ability to nullify pillboxes and to assist in street fighting, where it would gain the subacay Casa Busta, or Housebreaker. The non-armour effectiveness and versatility of the Piat during the Italian campaign was also highlighted by the use of the Piat in the light mortar roll, with one Piat apparently firing 600 rounds in a day. Another example of Piats being used against machine gun positions, snipers, and targets of opportunity were not infrequent. The need to promote the effectiveness of the Piat as a newly introduced anti-tank weapon saw successful actions being highlighted and disseminated to troops to spread the word about the Piat's effectiveness. One such action in December 1943 saw a Canadian sergeant, John Paul Joseph Rousseau, get to win 35 yards of a Panzer IV, hit the turret and cause a secondary ammunition explosion, destroying the tank and the crew. First Canadian Division highlighted Rousseau's success. He would receive the military medal in a training mem memorandum stating that this action demonstrated clearly that the enemy tanks can be dealt with effectively by infantry men who have confidence in their weapons and the ability to use them. This use of memoranda to advertise successful encounters was important, emphasising to troops that the Piat, if handled properly, was a tank killing weapon and was similar to training films which had been used to reinforce the idea that the boys' anti-tank rifle was still a capable weapon. One of the most famous peer actions of World War II occurred on the 16th of May 1943 at Monte Cassino, resulting in a Victoria Cross for Fusilier Francis Frank Jefferson, 2nd Battalion Lancashire Fusiliers. Dug in a defensive position and armed only with peers, Jefferson took the initiative as German Stug 3 assault guns moved forward towards his company. Moving forward under fire, Jefferson stood up and engaged the lead Stug at 20 yards, penetrating the armour just below the gun and setting the ammunition on fire. The recoil force of the spring surprised him, knocking him to the ground. He reloaded, ready to gauge the next stug, but wisely withdrew. The subsequent photograph of Jefferson proudly standing in front of the knocked out stug with his pit is reminiscent of big game hunters on safari and harks back to the big game hunting description used in the earlier boys' anti-tank training manuals. Again, actions such as Jefferson and Rousseau demonstrated what the pit could do to German armour, but both these actions required the operator to expose themselves in the open and to engage their targets at relatively low ranges, which required a certain level of steeliness as the gallantry medals signify. The pit was also put to good use in Normandy, providing D-Day airborne air landing elements with a means to at least defend themselves from German armour counterattacks, as long of course as their weapons survived the landing. But for those in action, the pit offered a direct and indirect fire weapon unlike any other in their inventory, with the Piat being used in the light mortar roll as well. Despite its weight, configuration and limited range, the Piat offered the infantry a transportable anti-tank weapon deployable in the Bocage country, where tank and anti-tank gun support was strictly limited. In a broadcast from Normandy in late June, BBC war correspondent Robert Dunnett gave an indication of the Piat's value to the troops. If ever an infantry weapon has justified its existence, that weapon is the Piat. Every day one hears of German tanks being knocked out by Piats, in copses, behind hedges, among groups of ruined buildings, in any sort of position where our men can find cover enough to creep up to them with their Piats. Our infantry swear by the Piat. This was not an idle boast, given that 21st Army Group's operational research section identified that 7% of all German tanks were knocked out by Piats between the 6th of June and the 31st of August. Of course, probably the most famous pit actions of all were at Arnhem, September 1944, during Operation Market Garden, a battle subsequently immortalised by that staple of many a Sunday afternoon's TV viewing, A Bridge Too Far, in which Anthony Hopkins, Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Frost, 
Cries. Take cover! Bring up the pier! As enemy armour crosses the bridge. Apart from a few six pounder anti tank guns at their disposal, British 1st Airborne Corps relied on the pier at the platoon level to provide their main anti tank weapon support. Frost and his men's gallant fight at the northern end of the bridge halted Grabner's 9th SS Recce Battalion's assault in its tracks, leaving upwards of 20 burning airfields smouldering on the bridge. It was only when the Piats had depleted their ammunition that the German armour was safely able to press forward. Amongst the heroism, Major Robert Kine, 2nd Battalion, the South Staff Regiment's actions on September the 20th at Oosterbeck stand out. Using the pier in a mortar roll, Major Kane used his elevation to drop bombs onto a self-propelled AFV. Kane was subsequently wounded and lost his number two to artillery fire. He was further wounded in the face whilst engaging two more tanks, when a second pier bomb detonated prematurely in his face as it left the launcher. Not being deterred, Kane picked up another pier and started to stalk more German tanks that were advancing towards them. He hit the first tank but was wounded for a third time but carried on firing until the disabled tank was knocked down by a 75mm Pakowitzer. He continued his one-man panzer wrecking onslaught the following day, engaging three more tanks, again with little regard for his personal safety, only swapping to a two-inch mortar when the Piat had run out of ammo. Major Kane was the only one of five VC recipients at our to survive. Moving on to the weapon itself, the museum's pit is painted in the original brown finish, and as you can see, it has a notable white, cream-coloured aiming stripe running along its centre. In terms of size, the pit is not a particularly large weapon, measuring 39 inches, or just under a metre long. And even though it had not achieved its target weight of 28 pounds, it could still be carried by one man. It now weighed in at 34.5 pounds, roughly 15.5 kilograms. It would have been a bit of a hefty metal lump to carry around for any length of time, although if you transported the Blacker Bombard, you would have considered it to be a lightweight in comparison. At the rear, there is the butt. This was fitted with a canvas garter cheek rest. After this is the buffer section, containing the spigot mainspring, which reaches as far as the trigger. Improvements to the life of the mainspring were carried out throughout its production, rising from a use expectancy of around 200 to four to five hundred rounds, with later modifications doubling that figure. Our example is uncocked with the spigot protruding and is complete with its firing pin. The bomb support with the projectile guide plates are to the front of the weapon, which allowed the Piat bomb to be inserted and held in position. Replacing the original bipod is the adjustable monopod, capable of ele elevating the Piat to an angle of up to 40 degrees. A cork stopper on a chain was supplied to protect the spigot opening from dirt, etc. when cocked. A canvas carrying sling would also have been fitted. Two folding sight apertures are located at the rear and at the front for the Piat's primary anti-tank roll. Originally the rear sight had two apertures, graduated to 170 yards, but an improved rear sight, this is a Mark III, provided the gunner with three range apertures, 110, 80 and 50 yards. An interesting feature of the pit is located at the side of the aperture sight. This is the quadrant sight, which was graduated at 100 yard intervals up to a maximum range of 370 yards for light mortar duties. Last but not least, located underneath the pit's body is the spring operated firing mechanism. This consists of a rear grip, trigger, trigger guard and safety catch lever. Moving on to the museum's Mark IV pit bomb, this would have been stored in a container and usually carried in sets of three. Each bomb would have had its 426 Gray's fuse attached to the tail, ready for the loader to arm later. The retaining clip is located at the end of the tube. A propellant cartridge, when ignited, propels the bomb towards the target at 87 yards, 80 meters per second. The Mark IV bomb differed from the Mark III due to the insertion of two mild steel discs just in front of the cartridge. This modification was added because it had been found that when the warhead detonated on the target, it flung fragments back through the tail tube at 3,000 feet per second towards the operator. This had caused injuries. The main body of the Mark IV projectile features a 50-50 explosive mix of RDX and TNT. A cortex detonator is centrally located in the body and links the explosive to the graze fuse 
this number 426 fuse had the safety feature of arming during flight rather than when being handled. With regard to training and operating the pit, a small arms training pamphlet, number 24, was produced in June 1943. In the pamphlet, the pit was described as a light self-cocking weapon designed to stop and knock out enemy air AFEs. Initial training was broken down into two consecutive 40-minute sessions. Interestingly, the text specifically identifies the pit as shoulder controlled and instruction included to stop any potential confusion as to how it should be fired. The pamphlet went on to emphasize that the pit differed radically from other small arms, being as simple as it is unorthodox, and that therefore training had to be exceptionally thorough. Although the writer added the odd caveat that it is not essential, however, to follow rigidly the illustration of cocking and uncocking the weapon. Soldiers' accounts of the pit give an impression of their wariness of the 200 pounds per square inch mainspring and its ability to cause damage to the operator, whether cocking or firing. As is usual, instructors would tend to emphasise bad practice with apocryphal stories abounding about poor so-and-so bracing their feet against a tree and suffering a broken back. But to be fair, the spring doesn't appear to have been a major problem once it had been fired. So it was designed to recock on this action. However, the initial cocking of the spring for the first shot has been described as murder and used are going redder and redder as they physically battled the spring into position. Even the training pamphlet makes it clear that considerable effort is required to overcome the resistance of the mainspring. The pit remained difficult for all users when in action as the initial cocking operation invariably required the operator to attempt to cock the spring lying on their back. Firstly, they would need to position their feet either side of the butt with a bomb support over one shoulder. Then with one hand grasping the trigger guard underneath and the other hand on any part which gave good leverage, the operator would sit up or bend their knees, depending on cover, and pull the outer casing away from the shoulder piece. The instruction continued that pushing with your feet and pulling with the hands on the outer casing was necessary until you heard a click. As you can imagine, this was not an easy operation to achieve with an enemy in close proximity. With regard to firing in the anti-tank role, training pamphlet number 24 recommended choosing a firing position which allowed the firer elbow room to trap the target. It also cautioned that due to its limited range, all efforts should be made to fire from a concealed position. Whilst the pit could be operated by one person, it was officially seen as a two-man weapon. One to fire, the second to load. It was strongly emphasised that no bomb should be loaded on a protruding spigot. Before the bomb can be fired, the fuse has to be inserted. To load, number two first removes the dust plug from the, the bomb tail. He then removes the muzzle plug, followed by the thimble. He inserts the fuse and replaces the thimble. The bomb is then placed nose first with its fins to the rear in the bomb support so that the guide ring is engaged between the guide plates to prevent misfires and to secure the bomb so it doesn't fall out if depressing the pit for firing. The loader must make certain that the tail is pressed down as far as possible using the flat of his hand and move out of the way. This process would take approximately two to three seconds. He would then prepare a second bomb. Meanwhile, the number one raises the rear and front sights and adjusts the monopod to line the sights up. The rules for aiming were, against head-on and retiring tanks, keep the foresight in the centre of the aperture and aim at the centre of the tank. Against crossing tanks, aim one length in front of the tank from the centre. Advice was given about judging the lead necessary for a tank and increasing elevation at longer ranges. To fire, the number one raised the shoulder place into the shoulder, pushed the safety catch forward and used his left hand on the gator to steady the weapon. Unfortunately, it was found that if the gunner failed to brace the weapon sufficiently when firing, that the peat was prone to not recock itself and would have to be done manually. The right thumb of the operator would go behind the grip and two fingers placed on the trigger. Once the trigger was pressed, there was an appreciable delay before the bomb was fired. The recoil was described as being a steady thrust, the spring helping to reduce the recoil. But it was important to maintain correct hold and aim during delay or the target may be missed. What would then happen is that when the number one pulled the trigger, the spigot would be released and propelled by the tension of the mainspring forward down the full length of the guide tube 
into the base of the bomb's tail tube. This whole process took a tenth of a second. Then the firing pin, located at the end of the spigot, would ignite the propellant cartridge inside the tail, which in turn would form a gas seal at the top of the tail tube and create the propellant gases, which exit the bomb tail tube and push against the spigot head. The pressure of the spigot head and propellant gases push the bomb forward, dropping the loading clip, and project the bomb out of the pit at 262 feet, 80 meters per second, while simultaneously exerting rearward pressure against the spigot and pushing the spring and sleeve bolt backwards until they are held in place by the trigger me mechanism, which recooks the weapon ready for the next bomb. This velocity is almost identical to the M1 bazooka, but of course the bazooka uses electric current to ignite its rocket rather than the spigot-initiated firing pin. Also, the pit bomb is launched at the end of the weapon as opposed to the bazooka, which is launched at the rear and uses the whole tube to burn its rocket propellant and in the process, creating a backblast. This lack of backblast was one of the benefits of the Piat's launching mechanism, as it allowed it to be fired from enclosed spaces, so it did not give away the operator's position to the enemy. Piat saw action throughout Northwest Europe and thousands were supplied to the Soviet Union, with little evidence of them being used in action. Piat were issued to SOE operators and used by resistance forces, such as the Polish Home Army, who received 250 during the Warsaw Uprising. The pit was also used in Burma and the Pacific, mainly against bunkers and other targets of opportunity, due to the lack of Japanese tanks as the war progressed. However, it's fair to say that there were some official negative views of the pit. Studies by the US and Australia, who curiously decided to rename the pit as the Pitta, Projector Infantry Tank Attack, had reservations about the pit's effectiveness with the US deciding that it was not a suitable jungle warfare weapon. They felt that it could not engage targets from the prone position due to the vegetation. The Australians, meanwhile, were not impressed by the Piat's ability to penetrate Japanese wooden earthwork, commentating that the PETA is not a suitable weapon for such actions. The problem with both of these views was that the Piat had been originally conceived as an anti-tank weapon, which afforded the infantry with a mobile anti-tank defence weapon and which had a handy secondary ability to penetrate reinforced concrete. It's not fair to be overly critical to failures which were not its primary function, and this is a bit of a harsh view. The pit enjoyed a limited life with British forces post-war, primarily being used by national servicemen, and it was largely obsolete for Korea. However, the pit saw service with other nations' forces in Greece, the Abu Israeli wars, and a number of post-colonial wars in Southeast Asia. In summary, the pier offered the British and Commonwealth servicemen during World War II with a significant upgrade on the boys' anti-tank rifle. Yes, it had a fairly short range and was difficult to manually cock, especially under fire, but its ability to penetrate 100 millimetres of armour meant that it could defeat most of the German AFVs which confronted it. If you were without tank support or a lightly armed unit, airborne or commando, the pit offered you a standoff anti-tank weapon which could be easily concealed and carried. It proved itself in North Africa, Europe and Asia and was ready when required.